What is a reasonable expectation for a front rise return? Because on the A checkoff card, the proficiency card, it's like front risers if you're if you're strong enough, basically. Yeah. But like yeah. what I am flying a 210 right now at 0.8 wing loading, like there's got to be something that I can, I mean, I'm not so strong, but I'm not so weak. Like what, what yeah. kind of action are we looking to achieve yeah. realistically well, I mean, as a student? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's different functions to the fronts, right? So if you just want to, for instance, get down a little bit because your path on final is too high and you're going to overshoot, front risers can prevent that overshoot. If you do it too low, it's a problem. So you got to do your exercises up high. Um, and if you're flying full speed, and this is an important idea, is that the front riser pressure uh, is going to be higher because you're flying faster, right? So the higher the airspeed, the less surgible the canopy is. And coming off of the brakes where you've sort of held it down at least half brakes for you know at least several seconds, then you get off of it. The canopy softens as you lift your hands because you're unpinching the tail, right? So you're increasing the volume in the moment of the surge as you grab the front risers. And if you pull them down right then and there, it's way easier. So even on a 210, I believe you can get some front riser input. Um, if you're only pulling to a teeny bit, it may be, get, be get, getting very heavy and pulls out within a second or two. Same thing with the front riser turn. It may pull out really, really quick. So you might have to go beyond just a little bit of input to get that sustainable dive where you can do it for more than two seconds. Um, so ex explore, first of all, before you even start pulling the fronts, getting to them, right? So, I mean, it sounds simple. You reach up and grab them, but there is a technique. Um, you know, looking at, well, first of all, do you have dive loops? A lot of student canopies don't have a front riser loop on the top of the front risers, just below the, the connector link. We call it a dive loop. Um, and if it doesn't, don't worry about it. Grab all the way up by this, this link, by the connector link, and just pull down from the top of the riser. Don't put your fingers in the lines. That's a poor choice because you can get your fingers stuck, especially if you've got gloves on. It's going to pinch your fingers. Um, so just grab around this link if you don't have dive loops. And just get used to being you know, in a touch of brakes, looking at where you want to grab and then grabbing there again and again and again to the point where you don't need to look anymore because you know where they are and you get a consistent mechanics of how you come up from the front as opposed to straight up where you might get the rears or you might get a front and a rear it happens all the time uh, so right now i think that that is that's vital is to rehearse that quickness in between the inputs in between brakes and fronts or whatever um, breaks to rears, same thing, um, and then work on that that you know sort of sustainable dive where you add the brakes first, look, surge, grab, haul it, haul it right in. Right? Like, I mean, you're really trying to pull that thing down a foot. Uh, the parachute doesn't mind, but you got to look at the back of the parachute as you do it in these first experiments up above cutaway altitude. If you haul the front risers in and you look at the back of the canopy and you see the back is pulled down, your brakes are short for the amount of front riser input that you gave. So you, now you have to either do less front riser input, you need to grab higher on the risers, or you need longer brake lines um, or, or all of the above. <laughs> Um, and so a reasonable expectations to answer the question more specifically, um, if you're a, a, you know, relatively aggressive in your braking and surging and the timing of that transition from brakes into the diving front risers, um, you should be able to hold that canopy in a straight front riser dive for at least two seconds. And if you turn the canopy on a front riser, you go straight off of it into a single front riser, you should be able to turn the thing at least 90 degrees. But after the 90 degree turn is complete and you're, you still want to keep spiral diving towards the ground, that's where I would suggest switching from the front riser input, which is going to pull out of your hands despite your intention, and you lean deeper in the harness, right? So you lean way over into the turn and that keeps the turn going. And then you can reach back to the rear riser on the low side of the canopy and continue that turn where it dives fast because a toggle turn is you know it's it's a braking maneuver and it's got a lot of lift associated with that input 
Um, so fronts or rear risers are much less distorted uh, as far as the canopy con is concerned. So you got less drag. And so it dives faster without turning as fast as a toggle turn will. Um, so you don't get as dizzy. So I think that's a good thing to work on is to see if you can get that front riser turn to initiate the rotation in, in a steepening maneuver where the canopy is dropping its pitch angle in the process of beginning the turn. And then you keep it in that spiral dive by leaning into the harness, switching over to the rear riser and giving some input there, pushing outward on the outside rear riser group to drive you into the turn. Um, this all sounds extreme, but you know, if you look around, geez, there's four other canopies at your altitude and they're you know, students that don't know what they're doing, you want to get the hell away from them. This is a nice way. Even just one 360 will drop you a couple hundred feet. And that but might be all the vertical separation you need to have a stress-free stress -free pattern, you know, without competition. Um, so so the, I would say a reasonable expectation is to be able to do a front riser 360, but you're not holding the front riser the whole time, Right. You're just beginning the process that way. It's a very different spiral than just doing a spin on a toggle. Um, yeah, it's uh, I use it all the time. Yeah. So you would say like, because I have asked people about front riser turns, not instructors, but they're like, oh, that's ridiculous. Don't even try. But you're saying with good technique, you can at least engage and then continue. Like anyone should be able to engage and continue, not necessarily staying yeah. on the front riser though. Abs exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. But most people don't have that information. <laughs> they, it just right. never occurred to them on their own. And nobody said, by the way, just because you want to do a diving spiral that doesn't spin fast doesn't mean you have to be uh, flying it the whole time on the fronts. Because I'd, I'd be surprised if you could get past 90 degrees on, on actually holding the front riser the whole time. That would, that would surprise me. I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm just saying it would surprise me because I, I have trouble on a 210 personally. Uh, with the front riser pressure, the resistance. What's the next one? I love this. Hey, this is great. So you're in, in safety part three. Um, you're talking about drawing vectors and, and calculating the landing area. And you had mentioned like you can be scientific about it. Mm -hmm. But um, how like to what extent do you actually do that? Like especially in variable winds, do you yeah. just sort of like mentally go through it? I wasn't quite sure what that looked like outside yeah. of a piece of graph paper. Yeah, well, what, what I would suggest is, is to do the, the, that geometry, the math behind it, um, to sort of working in, with the numbers and then superimposing on the Google Maps at your location for low wind, medium wind, and high wind to get a sense of the pattern shape. You know, the length of, of your final approach in low wind, medium wind, and high wind. So you know those numbers and you have those locations relative to the drop zone. So you know where your base leg needs to be, right? And you also need to know how far your parachute travels on the downwind leg. But it's not like you need to do that all the time. You just switch in your brain from low wind, medium wind, high wind, and you, you superimpose that template in your mind, those distances uh, and those angles on this situation based on the experiments that you, you did in testing at say 2000 feet or so where you parked it into the wind and you got a sense of, of your glide ratio. And, the, and from that information, you, you very quickly design your pattern and you think, all right, it's a windy one. All right, so I'm gonna stay way upwind and I'm gonna you know, spend very little time on the downwind leg. I'm gonna make that turn before I even get to the target and drift into place. Um, and I'm gonna expect that target is gonna be way down here, but it's not so mathy anymore. That was the scaffolding around the, the chapel that I'm building. But at some point I have to take down that scaffolding and just, you know, trust 